So welcome. Thank you all for coming. I am Kevin Soling, and this is the Disinformation Campaign Against Homeschooling, an event hosted by Ideological Diversity, a student organization at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. I've been quite heartened by the overwhelming amount of support for this conference. As the title of the event makes clear, it was organized in response to attacks on homeschooling in the media and, and in academia. More specifically, an upcoming summit that is being hosted by the Child Advocacy Program at Harvard Law School. I became aware of the summit when I read The Risks of Homeschooling, published in Harvard Magazine. The article uncritically presents a string of fallacies about homeschooling beneath an illustration that would be deemed comically ironic if it were displayed on its own. Instead, the depiction of a forlorn homeschool child locked inside of a house of books, peering through a barred window at her public school peers, who are joyfully running around and playing freely, is simply bad propaganda. Many people do not realize that faculty and students are free to engage in intellectual pursuits that might not always be worthy of Harvard or even Yale, such as the price of academic freedom. The transgression for me was that half-baked opinions masquerading as research were published in Harvard Magazine, which confers a kind of institutional validation. I'm currently working on my fourth graduate degree from Harvard, and I worry that the value of my diplomas may be diminished by their association with shoddy work that is used to advance an agenda. The dishonest portrayal of homeschooling, combined with an uninformed policy recommendation to ban the practice, could not go unchallenged, and so here we are. The purpose of this conference is not just to fight disinformation and provide research-based data about the process of learning inside and outside of the schoolhouse, but to, but to preserve the integrity of academia, which is often under fire. So, in addition to myself, the panelists who will be presenting are Kerry McDonald, a senior education fellow at the Foundation for Economic Education, adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute and author of Unschooled, Raising Curious, Well-Educated Children Outside the Conventional Classroom, Patrick Ferenga, president of John Holt, GWS, and a writer, publisher, uh, publisher of materials about how children learn outside of school, Michael Donnelly, Homeschool Legal, Legal Defense Association Senior Counsel, Patrick Henry College Constitutional Law Instructor, graduate of Boston University School, uh, School of Law and London School of Economics, and a homeschooling parent of seven, Corey DeAngelis, Director of School Choice at Reason Foundation, adjunct scholar at Cato Institute, and the Executive Director at Educational Freedom Institute, Brian Connor, President of the National Youth Rights Association, which is dedicated to defending the freedom, equality, and rights of all young people by challenging age discrimination and prejudice, and Peter Gray, research, research professor of developmental psychology at Boston College, president of the Alliance of Self-Directed Education, and author of Free to Learn, Why Unleashing the Instinct to Play Will Make Our Children Happier, More Self-Reliant, and Better Students for Life. So let's begin. First, a science lesson. There might be a quiz, so pay attention and take notes. Scientific research is performed by a process of experimentation. An experiment is an intervention designed to test a hypothesis. With me so far? Public schooling is an experiment. It is an intervention based on the following hypothesis. If a child is forced to go to school eight hours a day, five days a week, nine months a year for 13 years, then something good will happen. It is important to note that something good has never been consistently defined. It could be learning literacy and other tools for self-actualization. It could be acquiring skills for the workplace. It could be absorbing democratic values and knowledge of the rights and obligations of being a citizen. In fact, we'll never know what schools are supposed to do because if a principal or superintendent ever had the courage to say what their school was supposed to do, parents would object because the scope would either be depressingly limited or impossibly broad, and the school would be held accountable to generating some kind of outcome. By regulating the mission of school to people's imaginations, schools can avoid being exposed as frauds. But back to experiments. To test a hypothesis, you must establish that results, if there are any, could not have occurred by chance or from some other cause. In the case of schooling, the purported benefits must be measured against a control group, but there, here's the catch. The design of the public school system has never been experimentally tested. 
For roughly 180 years, we have been taking children away from their families and forcing them to spend much of their lives in an institution that has never established it possesses any merit. The belief that we need schools is completely faith-based. Plenty of scientific studies exist within the confines of schools, but they are only internally valid and thus they are not reliable because the results cannot be generalized. When an eminent scientist or scholar objects to the teaching of creationism in school, they are basically saying barbers should wear surgical masks when they perform, partake in bloodletting. Or I read the horoscopes every day and the advice for Sagittarius is completely off. They should stop publishing readings for Sagittarius. It is inherently absurd to criticize one isolated component of an intellectually dishonest practice. The design of public schools did not arise from any scientific method. When someone insists that civics or ethics or basic finances or anything meaningful that is absent from the curriculum should be taught in school, just cut them off. They're implicitly promoting pseudoscience. To most people, schools work because they feel like they do, or at least they should, and because over the course of being in school, they learn things. What they do not grasp is that while they did learn things, they would also have learned things without school. More importantly, they were robbed of their potential because schools retarded their intellectual, emotional, psychological, and social development. How do we know this? Science. Because of limited time, I can't go into all the ways scholastic instruction is set up that violates many things we know about the processes of learning effectively. But I will address one significant factor. Public school, by design, is a captive environment. What constitutes captivity? Well, it is a place where movement is limited, where the subject is removed from their attached environment, i.e. their home, where they have limited privacy, where they are tamed such that the flight impulse is diminished, and where they are afforded basic survival needs. This is true of every single public school, and I have to stress this because the reaction I always get is, yeah, schools are terrible, but not the ones my kids go to. This is the kind of empirical denialism that we are up against. There is a wealth of data on what happens to people when they are placed in captivity. This includes impaired memory and concentration, anger, anxiety, depression, learned helplessness, and chronic stress. All of these symptoms are widely on display in schools, and, their persists, and the persistence of chronic stress has been corroborated by measurements of students' cortisol levels. In other words, one of the most significant problems with schools, the consequence of forcing kids to be in a place where they are held captive, isn't the teachers, administrators, or parents' fault, although all these people are complicit in supporting the school system. No school reform has effort has ever addressed this, and this is one of the reasons why reforms always fail. How do we know schools fail? Data, observation, and empirical evidence. Let's look at each something good that schools are supposed to, you know, designed to instill. We know they perform poorly when it comes to academics. Schools neglect a plethora of subjects. They can focus primarily on English and math, but according to the Department of Education, only 37% of 12th graders perform at or above proficient levels in literacy, and only 25% of 12th graders perform at or above proficient levels in math. What is more remarkable is that you can't even fully credit schools with attaining these dismal outcome because many of those students learn those skills in their home environment. As for learning a trade, public schools don't do that. You would need to go to a vocational school, become an, impress, uh, an apprentice, or develop those skills directly to acquire a talent. The most Orwellian claim is that schools promote democratic ideals. No, schools are openly hostile to democratic principles. Again, all schools. Every public school has an authoritarian hierarchical power structure with students at the bottom powerless to control the conditions that they are subjected to. In every school, meaningful dissent is suppressed. The courts have affirmed that students can have certain speech censored, be subjected to warrantless searches, and incriminate themselves. They can be beaten by administrators in 19 states to the point where they require hospitalization, and they have even been strip searched by faculty without consequence. Even without these extreme scenarios, everyday existence for students involves demands for subjugation and acquiescence. They must adhere to dictates stating where they must be, who they may associate with, and what they are permitted to think. Because authoritarian power is advertised as being wielded for the good of the students, this approach is considered justified. Author C.S. Lewis noted, of all tyrannies, a tyranny sincerely exercised for the good of its victims may be, may be the most oppressive. No one 
who earnestly believes in human rights and who is intellectually honest would advocate sending a child to school without that child's consent. If conditions in schools, again, all schools, were unchanged except that students were designated enemy combatants, teachers and administrators would be dragged to The Hague for war crimes in violation of the terms of the Third Geneva Convention, specifically Article 17, 18, 22, 25, 26, 38, 51, 52, 53, and 99, which govern discipline, labor demands, personal effects, general health and well-being, diet, and exposure to humiliation. Abuse in schools is so rampant, it is an indelible feature, not an anomaly. Everyone is familiar with ubiquitous bullying and pervasive psychiatric abuse, where children are drugs so they can cope with being in school, even though the drugs have debilitating long-term physical and mental side effects. But there are also other horrors that get very little attention. The Associated Press uncovered roughly 17,000 official reports of sex assaults in schools over a four-year period, and it is reasonable to assume a large number of those incidents, a large number of incidents were not reported. Solitary confinement is being phased out of prisons because it is widely considered to be inhumane, yet every year on average over 37,000 students are punished by being placed in solitary confinement in their schools, which often produces profound depression, social anxiety, panic attacks, and paranoia that never goes away. In general, parents want their children to be good-hearted, intellectually curious, open-minded, creative, confident, articulate, expressive, self-reliant, and rational. Ask yourself these three questions. Do you think sending kids to institutionalized schooling is the best way to achieve these goals? Can you identify which feature of schooling is most conducive to achieving any one of these ends? Are any of these traits a goal of public schooling? Numerous studies show that public schools inhibit each one of these characteristics, and even if you try to promote these traits at home, the culture of schools are openly hostile to that of the family because kids must conform to the school environment or be subjected to unrelenting abuse from their peers. I'd like to conclude with a poem that was written by a high school senior in Alton, Illinois. The poem is called, He Was Square Inside and Brown. He drew things inside that needed saying, beautiful pictures he kept under his pillow. When he started school, he brought them to have along like a friend. It was funny about school. He sat at a square brown desk like all the other square brown desks and his room, was a square brown room like all the other rooms, tight and close and stiff. He hated to hold the pencil and chalk, his arms stiff, his feet flat on the floor, stiff, the teacher watching and watching. She told him to wear a tie like all the other boys. He said he didn't like them. She said it didn't matter what he liked. After that, the class drew. He drew all yellow. It was the way he felt about mourning. The teacher came and smiled. What's this? Why don't you draw something like Ken's drawing? After that, his mother brought him a tie, bought him a tie, and he always drew airplanes and rocket ships like everyone else. He was square inside and brown, and his hands were stiff. The things inside that needed saying didn't need it anymore. They had stopped pushing, crushed, stiff, like everything else. Two weeks after writing this, he killed himself. Suicide is another prominent feature of public schools that gets insufficient attention. Otherwise, the very first question a parent would ask before enrolling their child is not about average test scores, but rather the school's suicide rate. The Centers for Disease Controls report that one in six high school students seriously consider suicide and one in 12 makes an attempt on their life. Is this really an institution we want children to be forced to attend? I hope everyone watching leaves appropriately outraged by the unfounded attacks and alternatives to what is effectively institutionalized child abuse. I'm going to turn you over to Carrie. Kevin, and thank you to the Ideological Diversity Student Group, the Harvard Kennedy School for sponsoring this important event. I am honored to be joined by such an esteemed group of panelists to highlight this disinformation campaign against homeschooling 
as a Harvard alumna, an education researcher, and most importantly, a homeschooling mom of four children right here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, just down the road from Harvard's main campus, I was, like many of you, appalled when I read the recent Harvard Magazine article against homeschooling that was based on Harvard Law School professor Elizabeth Bartholet's lengthy paper in the Arizona Law Review calling for a presumptive ban on homeschooling. I wrote a letter to the editor of Harvard Magazine expressing my disappointment with Harvard Magazine's inaccurate and one-sided portrayal of homeschooling that is not at all reflective of 21st century homeschooling. And I also published that letter at fee.org where it's been widely shared. Professor Bartlett tries to say that homeschooling should be banned because homeschooled children are not in school and could be abused by their families. But of course, as Kevin has just mentioned, abuse is rampant in schools as well. Uh, in my work, I get emails and it is all the time from families who are choosing homeschooling to escape widespread abuse in public schools. Maybe their child has been bullied or has endured persistent peer abuse, both physical and emotional. Uh, sometimes these children are abused by their teachers and other school officials. Newspaper headlines regularly expose how various public school teachers have been arrested or convicted uh, for abuse against students. Uh, I think Corey DeAngelis will talk about this a little bit more, but there are also studies, uh, including one, a 2004 U.S. Department of Education study that found that one out of 10 uh, public school students will be sexually assaulted, sexually abused by their public school teacher by the time they graduate from high school. Tragically, child abuse happens everywhere, but homeschooling is the exit ramp for many loving families who want to protect their children from the harm they endure in public schools. Bartha Ladd and others make it seem that home is the prison and school is the liberator, as Kevin mentioned, the Harvard mag Magazine illustration tried to show, when for many children, uh, school is most certainly the prison where they are trapped inside a compulsory classroom and homeschooling really is the relief. While some of the homeschooling families I talk to are fleeing these abusive schooling environments, others simply desire a different learning environment for their children outside of a conventional classroom. Maybe their children are bored at school, they're unchallenged, and the parents want to give them a more rigorous academic environment. Maybe they're world schoolers and the family travels for work or for pleasure or a combination, really becoming immersed in many cultures across the globe. Um, maybe their child is energetic and exuberant and has a hard time sitting still and a parent wants to give their child that freedom of movement and discovery and exploration and help them to retain that natural curiosity and creativity rather than having it crushed by a system of mass schooling that demands conformity and compliance. We know that fortunately uh, homeschooling is legal in all 50 50 U.S. states has been since the mid-1990s, but of course now that right, that exit ramp is under attack, which with calls for this national ban on, a, on the practice, or at the very least heavy regulation to make it look like uh, homeschooling is simply public school at home. One of the more concerning characteristics I thought of the both the Arizona Law Review piece and then again sized in the Harvard Magazine article is the anti-religion sentiment, and in particular, the palpable disdain for conservative Christian beliefs and values. And look, I'm not at all religious, but I find it deeply concerning when individuals and families are persecuted for their religious beliefs or values. Uh, this bias against religious and conservative families is particularly strange when Bartholet herself indicates that one of her reasons for wanting to ban homeschooling is to make sure that children grow up with, quote, tolerance of other people's viewpoints. And yet her piece is so intolerant toward those who don't think or live like she does. Uh, twice in her Arizona Law Review article, as well as in the Harvard Magazine article, Bartholet says that up to 90% of today's homeschoolers are driven by conservative Christian beliefs, to which I would say first, that's not true. But second, even if it were true, so what? Why would that matter? Why would it matter if 90% of today's homeschoolers were driven by atheists? It matter if 90% of today's homeschoolers were driven by Buddhist beliefs. This should not be a justification for increased oversight and suspicion of a particular group. 
That said, more reliable data show that about two thirds of today's homeschoolers in this country are identify as Christian, which is equal to the overall US population, according to the Pew Research Center, that found that about two thirds of Americans identify as Christian. But even if they're Christian, they're not, most of them are not being driven uh, to homeschool their children out of religious beliefs. Some are, and that's great, but that is not the case uh, for many of these homeschoolers. In fact, the most recent data out of the U.S. Department of Education found that the top motivator, the motivator that was cited most frequently for families when they were indicating why they chose homeschooling was concern about the environment of other schools, including safety, drugs, and negative peer pressure. And much of the recent growth in the U.S. homeschooling population over the past decade has come from urban secular families like mine who want more freedom and flexibility for our children's learning. You know, I first became interested in homeschooling and alternatives to school and education choice back in college and graduate school uh, about 20 years ago, but it was when I became a mom and was looking at education options for my own children that I discovered the real joy of homeschooling. I realized that if I sent my children to school, their learning would contract. They would go to the same building every day with the same age segregated group of peers, the same static handful of teachers doing the same standardized curriculum. And instead, I wanted my children to be fully and authentically immersed in our community, taking classes offered through our local museums and libraries, nature centers, maker spaces, building relationships with local shopkeepers who offer programming and mentorship, getting tutoring and guidance from experts in their fields. I wanted them to be free to learn, following their interests and talents, and not hold up in a compulsory school classroom. In fact, recent research on the socialization of homeschoolers by Daniel Ham Hamlin out of the University of Oklahoma found that homeschoolers have high levels of what he calls cultural capital, that they are frequently visiting libraries and museums and attending cultural events, in some cases even more so than their schooled peers. I'll wrap up by saying that this is really much more about, much more than homeschooling. I think homeschooling is the straw man in a much larger, more pernicious effort to remake American society and in particular to reinterpret the U.S. Constitution and the ways in which it has preserved the liberty interest of parents to raise and educate their views. In her law review article, Professor Bartholet calls the U.S. Constitution outdated and inadequate and advocates for a reinterpretation of the Constitution that moves from its historic model of negative rights or of individuals being free from state intrusion to positive rights in which the state grants rights and takes a much more interventionist role in American life and in the lives of families and children. Bartholet looks to Germany, where homeschooling is illegal, as the model the U.S. to follow in imposing a ban on homeschooling. I find this to be one of the most troubling recommendations in Bartholet's piece. The German pro against homeschooling dates back to 1938, and the Nazi regime, and an effort to subordinate the individual to the pot. Let's not act like Germany. Let's act, America. Thank you. And now we're turning it over to Pat for Anga. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Good afternoon. I'm Patrick Faranga author and publisher of books and articles about how children learn outside of school, and the president of John Holt GWS. GWS stands for Growing Without Schooling, the magazine John Holt founded in 1977 and that I published until it ceased in 2001. I've worked in the homeschooling movement since 1981 and with my wife homeschooled our three daughters. The COVID-19 pandemic is a time of isolation and introspection for us as individuals and a nation. However, the closing of our schools has added a new pressure to our lives. Parents must administer daily school lessons to their children while they are also figuring out how to work from home or how to cope with their loss of work. The schools, like everyone, were caught off guard by the pandemic and teachers are repurposing their daily lessons for the internet. 
but not everyone has internet access. Lessons made for the classroom don't easily convert to web-based instruction, and few parents appear to have the patience or knowledge to help their children with their school assignments. This situation is further exacerbated by schools and the media referring to this as homeschooling, which it is not. People who choose to homeschool do so after they give careful thought about how they're going to work and live together as a family. What is occurring is remote learning and crisis schooling, not homeschooling. Now, not all children learn in school despite the best efforts of teachers, of good teachers. The, Author John Holt pondered this at length during his years as a fifth grade teacher and in his first book, How Children Learn. Holt noticed that not only didn't the poor students learn, but the good students often didn't really learn either. Holt called this process a charade of learning that occurs in even the best schools. Holt wrote, the only difference between a good student and a bad student is the good one is careful to wait until after the test to forget what they learned. Today, more evidence of this is provided by the number of adults scouring the internet to relearn how to find, multiply fractions, properly spell words, or diagram sentences to teach their children at home. Learning is context sensitive, and if it is perceived as useless or unpleasant by the learner, it is unlikely that learning will remain with them. Like many other school reformers, past and present, Holt urged smaller schools and classes, more diverse teachers and subject matter, encouragement of interdisciplinary thinking, and plenty of free play for children. But the grind of industrial education pulverizes these options as too costly or too romantic. After seeing how his and other efforts at school reform in the 1960s were not well received by educators, Holt came to the idea that parents could use their homes as a base for their children's learning. Using their personal contacts and community resources, homeschooling parents act as general contractors for their children's learning, not the sole instructor. Today, with the internet and other media, there are even more opportunities for locating such help. Holt didn't like the word homeschooling because the learning he was talking about didn't have to take place at home nor follow school curricula. He coined the term unschooling to describe this way of learning. Holt felt schools and homeschoolers could cooperate for each other's benefit and that schools could learn a lot about how children learn by observing and working with homeschoolers. Homeschoolers have seen their eclectic approach help their children find work, contribute to society, and get into and graduate from college if that's their goals. Homeschoolers with very unconventional educations have gotten into higher education, including Harvard and other Ivy League schools. As homeschooling gained adherence and publicity throughout the 1970s, schools and their supporters actively pushed back to make homeschooling illegal. Homeschooling was not illegal in the United States, um, nor was it specifically legal. So Holt encouraged parents to stay out of court if possible. I see no point in confronting the authorities if you can dodge them, Holt said. But he also advised homeschoolers to hold their ground if they do go to court. Based on state and Supreme Court rulings that support educational choice and parental rights, Holt advised that parents have the right to educate their children in whatever way they believe in. The state cannot impose on all parents any kind of educational monopoly of schools, methods, or whatever. This interpretation was later upheld and expanded in a Massachusetts homeschooling court case in 1978, a state court case. Holt cites three more legal supports that are important for homeschoolers. One, the state may not deprive parents of the right to educate their children as they see fit for arbitrary reasons, but only for serious educational ones, which it must make known to the parents with all forms of due process. Second, a state that would deny parents these rights for arbitrary reasons by saying that their home education plan is inadequate has a burden of proof to show beyond a reasonable doubt that this is so. Parents are assumed to be competent to teach their children until proved otherwise. This assumption of competence is kin to and part of the general assumption of innocence of the accused which hold in all criminal proceedings. And third, in order to prove that the parents' education plans are inadequate, the state must show that its own requirements, regulations, and so on, 
are educationally necessary and do in fact produce in its own schools better results than parents are get or are likely to get. Now, the issue of child abuse at home has been raised as a reason to force homeschool children into public schools. In 1981, Holt wrote, when legislators passed laws saying that the state could, for neglect, remove children from the custody of their parents, what they had in mind was children who were starved or left naked or were brutally beaten and tortured or locked in closets or chained to furniture. They did not have in mind the children of conscientious and devoted parents whose only crime was that they did not approve of the kind of education offered in the local schools. To lump such parents with gross abusers of children, as schools have quite often done, is a most serious perversion of law and justice. Today, Elizabeth Bartholet, director of Harvard Law School's Child Advocacy Program, seeks to ban homeschooling on the grounds that homeschooling violates children's rights to a meaningful education and their right to be protected from potential child abuse and keep them from contributing positively to a democratic society. I've briefly addressed her mistaken ideas that homeschooling does not provide a meaningful education to children and that grown up homeschoolers do find work worth doing and contribute positively to society. And my uh, co-panelists will certainly be uh, adding more details to that. I now want to explore her charges regarding child abuse and democracy. Tara Westover's excellent and moving memoir, Educated, is used as a cudgel by Bartholet to show how cruel homeschooling can be. What needs to be stated clearly, and Westover does so repeatedly in her book, is that the neglect and physical abuse she suffered was a result of her father and brother's mental illnesses and their erratic domination over the family. Some people, including her grandmother, try to rescue Westover from the crazy home she is in, but it isn't easy for a child to leave their parents, and it takes her many years before she can make a clean break from her family. Though homeschooling provided cover, a cover story for her parents to keep her home, it was not the cause or reason for her abuse. Westover, Westover notes in her book that her older brother, who also left the family due to, their abuse, due to the abuse, successfully homeschooled his own children. In addition to being physically abused, Westover's par parents' religious beliefs prevented her from attending college and demanded instead that she be a wife and mother. Now, this is a clear violation of her rights as a person, let alone an American citizen. A person has the right to control and direct their own thoughts and learning and to speak them publicly. Holt describes this right as flowing from the First Amendment. He writes, a person's freedom of learning is part of his freedom of thought, even more basic than the freedom of speech. If we take from someone his right to decide what he will be curious about, we destroy his freedom of thought. We say, in effect, <clears throat> You must think not about what interests and concerns you, but what interests and concerns us. To create a law that requires people to attend only conventional school to prevent potential child abuse not only infringes upon everybody's educational freedom, it doesn't abuse, it directly address abuse. It merely puts the child in school and closes alternatives to school. This doesn't address children whose abuse is not detected by mandated reporters, nor does it address the physical abuse of children in public and private schools. Instead of using education as a workaround to protect children from abuse, let's grant all children the same protection adults have under the Bill of Rights. If an adult is physically beaten by someone, they have legal recourse to get redress. The real threat of a court case, fines, and jail keeps many from throwing punches when they want to do so. However, our society views children as a special exception to this rule of law. Wikipedia notes in 1977's case, Ingraham v. What Right, the U.S. Supreme Court held that the Cruel and Unusual Punishments Clause of the Eighth Amendment did not apply to disciplinary corporal punishment in public schools. As of 2018, corporal punishment is still legal in all private schools in the United States except New Jersey and Iowa. Legal in public schools in 19 states permitted in 18 and practiced in 15. A good number of parents choose to homeschool because of the bullying or mistreatment their children receive in public and private schools. Another concern about homeschooling is that it undermines democracy 
because homeschooled children will not learn the skills needed to participate in democracy. The idea that compulsory conventional schooling is need, needed to make citizens, to make proper citizens, is fraught with contradictions. For instance, nowhere is it stated in our founding documents that all citizens need to be processed in a school to participate in our democracy. And in the words of Ruth Sherman, a homeschooling mother in New York City from 1920, who, when asked how her son would learn about democracy if she removed him from public school, replied, you can't learn democracy in a place where it isn't practiced. Finally, some alternative schools allow children to completely participate in their school's governance in direct contrast to mainstream schooling. We are in the midst of a quarantine and the rise of domestic abuse is more likely. So we need to create protections for children that go beyond school attendance. The pandemic is forcing us to reintegrate children into our lives and schooling is likely to be very different for a while. We need all the tools we have as a society to get through this. And homeschoolers have years of experience they can share about living and learning with children. Rather than ban homeschooling, particularly in this time of quarantine, educators and parents should be talking with homeschoolers about how learning can be conceived and assessed more broadly and how children should be treated with the same dignity and respect we give adults. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick. That was great. Just to respond really quickly to something that you said, it's kind of bad timing for Elizabeth Bartholet's article to come out and be highlighted in Harvard Magazine, in which she argues that homeschooling protects kids or, or prevents kids from getting democratic values because the nation's report card just came out last week showing that the government schools only, the students in the government schools only have reached 15% proficiency in US history. And only, you know, three in every four kids are not proficient in geography or civics in the government schools. And just to clarify really quick up, up front as well, the other panelists have called these public schools, but I am not going to, you know, cede my language over to the other side because these are government schools. These are not, these schools are not open to the public. They discriminate based on zip code. You can't just go to any public school you want. So it's not like a public park. It's run by the government. It's operated by the government. It's funded by the government. It's compelled by the government. And uh, these are government schools. Let's, let's make it clear with, with the language really quick. But I'm going to use most of my time to respond to Bartholet's claims. I want to thank Carrie McDonald for doing a good job at that already, but I'll fill in the gaps a little bit and respond to her Arizona Law Review article. It's about 80 pages. And I thought it was going to be better than the risks of homeschooling article that was in Harvard Magazine, but it, does, it wasn't actually any better. It was just longer and fraught with the same logical uh, inconsistencies and 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 limits on, on her lim logical arguments. And, you know, she goes and calls for uh, a presumptive ban on homeschooling. And she doesn't really use statistics to back up her claims that homeschooling is the same thing as educational maltreatment or, or that it leads to more child abuse. She doesn't really back up these claims. And she just says things like, well, there's some families that might do this. And there are many families that might do this, but she doesn't actually cite many sources for many of her claims. And, you know, if you do a quick word search in her document, it's 80 pages, but you look up the word many, it appears 90 times. The word some, it appears 120 times. You add these together, it's 210 times. The word many or some is actually used in an article. Just for comparison, my latest study was 72 pages. I did a quick word search. The word some came up two times compared to her 120 times, and the word many came up two times compared to her 90 times. And I'm actually embarrassed. I'm sorry, guys. I shouldn't have used that word at all in my report. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed that I had two instances instead of zero instances because I like to back up my claims with statistics. The problem is Elizabeth Bartlett doesn't do that, and she paints with a broad brush and doesn't give us any idea of how often this is actually happening. Is many instances like 0.2% of the population? Is it 0.1% of the population? We don't really get an understanding of that. And she essentially wants everybody to come out of this and believe that homeschoolers are just doing so to abuse their children or to not provide them any meaningful education. Obviously, homeschool parents have the best uh, you know, instincts for their children and knowledge about how to provide that best education for their individual children. So in general, uh, I'm not saying that negative events never happen in the home, but I, I would argue that it's more likely that the kids are gonna pr be provided with a better education and the evidence actually supports the claim that uh, you know, uh, the, the evidence is in favor of homeschooling students performing better academically and socially. 
And look, she says a lot of the set things that might happen in the homeschool environment calls for a presumptive ban. But if she took her same logic and applied it to the government school system, she would instead have to call for a presumptive ban on the government school system. Because as Carrie uh, you know, linked to or, or earlier and talked about in, in 2004, the Department of Ed itself is the latest uh, data on this, said that one in every 10 kids in government schools will, be, will experience some form of sexual misconduct by the government employees themselves by the time the kids graduate from high school. That doesn't even count all the things that aren't reported. Uh, another report in 2010 the government, by the Government Accountability Office found that on average, teachers will jump between three different school districts before this abuse is actually caught, if ever. And you know, one offender alone can have up to 72 uh, victims in their lifetime. So it's not like uh, nothing is happening that is a negative event in the government school system. And that's what we should compare this to. We shouldn't make perfect the enemy of the good. We shouldn't use the exceptions to prove the rule as Elizabeth Bartlett is doing. And we shouldn't compare homeschooling to perfection. We should compare homeschooling to the realistic alternative. And we don't even have to say this happens sometimes or it happens you know, in many cases. We have actual hard statistics showing that this actually does happen in the government school system. So if you're going to ban uh, homeschooling, this would, you know, inadvertently lead to more abuse and more educational maltreatment in the government school system. As I said earlier, two out of every th three kids are not proficient in reading, according to the most recent Nations Report card. 79% of students, 79% uh, of government-run schools reported some type of violent incidents or crime happening in the most recent school year. And again, this is from the National Center of Education Statistics. And so again, we shouldn't make perfect the enemy of the good. And when, and like Carrie mentioned earlier, when Elizabeth Bartlett does make a citation and actually provides a statistic, for example, when she says 90% of you know, families are doing so for religious reasons, that's not even an accurate claim. And if you go to her footnotes and go to the first two sources under that, they go to blog pieces which aren't scientific articles. And I went through these blogs in, in places like The Atlantic, and I couldn't even really see where they found the 90% of families are actually uh, doing so because they're Christians. But again, to echo Carrie, even if 90% of families were Christians and doing it for that reason, and, and they have that First Amendment right to freely exercise a religious education for their families, even if people like Elizabeth Bartlett don't like it. And again, I'm not, I'm not a religious person myself, but I will fight to the death. Uh, Maybe not to the death, but I'll fight really hard for people to be able to freely exercise their religions uh, and their religious educations. Look, we can do this in private schools as well. It just so happens that you cannot do so in the government-run school system as it's set up. And look, so the evidence is positive as well, comparing between sectors homeschooling to the alternative, which is government schooling or, or any other type of regular type of schooling. Brian Ray in 2017 in the Journal of School Choice uh, summarized 45 different studies on this, all of the rigorous evidence on the subject, and he found that not every study was positive for homeschooling, but the vast majority of studies, I believe over 80% of the studies, were in favor of homeschooling. And Lindsey Burke also did a 2018 review of the evidence and similarly found positive results for homeschool students academically. And Brian Ray also did a 2018 review of the evidence, and there's not a lot of evidence on this, but from, from the evidence that we have, abuse rates seem to be lower in the home than they are in the schools. And then again, uh, in 2019, Daniel Hamlin found that kids are more likely to go to theaters and concerts, even after controlling for difference, differences in the background characteristics. And that's, that was a finding in favor of homeschool families. And look, Elizabeth Bartlett doesn't really contend with all this evidence. When she does, she just essentially stoops down to ad hominem and attacks people like Brian Ray and essentially attacks his funding sources and attacks his motives instead of uh, really, uh, you know, attacking the methods in the studies. Of course, the studies aren't perfect. Um, you know, she essentially makes perfect the enemy of the good when she does get into some of the methods of Ray's work. She'll say that this isn't all the homeschooling populations, but researchers know you don't, you don't get access to the full population of homeschoolers or even, you know, in other types of research either. You don't get the full population, but we can still learn things from subsets of the population. Uh, and especially if it's a, you know, a sample size of a, you know, a few thousand study, uh, students, which Ray cites pretty often. He pretty much uh, cites a lot of studies with large sample sizes. But so, so Elizabeth Bartlett takes that evidence and just shoots it aside and says, you know, it's positive, but this is just, you know, science that can't be trusted. And then she turns around in her same 80 page paper and either doesn't provide any statistics at all, or when she does, she'll cite something, you know, like in the Boston Globe just the other week, she said that, home, that there was some evidence of homeschoolers 
being more subject to abuse than kids in the regular schools. And then she cites a pediatrics article of only 28 uh, children um, from just five different clinics. And she extrapolates to the whole homeschool population and says that, well, based on this study of 28 students, um, you know, there's evidence that homeschoolers are abused at higher rates than governments. Well, she, she commits the same fallacies that she accuses uh, Brian Ray of, but she does it to a larger extent because Brian Ray studies at least have more than 28 students and are more representative of the population. The researchers themselves of this study finding, uh, you know, looking at 28 students, even said this was not a ran uh, this was a non-random sample. They cherry picked the students to tell a particular story, and they said that. And they said that other people should not use this for statistical comparison purposes, but that didn't prevent uh, Elizabeth Bartlett from doing just that in her recent Boston Globe piece. And the Boston Globe should really uh, issue a correction of that statement that was made just a week or two ago. But look, she, you know, even if the evidence wasn't in favor of homeschooling, that doesn't mean that there should be a presumptive ban on, on homeschooling. That, that still wouldn't mean that there should be a presumptive ban because look, science is not, you know, not perfect, it's flawed. And Bartlett, you know, admits that when it comes to positive studies of homeschooling. Um, and then also, I want to say on that, that study with the 28 students, uh, Elizabeth Bartlett attacked the character of Brian Ray, but the, then she turned around and cited a study uh, led by Barbara Knox, who was under investigation for pressuring her colleagues for, uh, you know, uh, saying that there was abuse of children when there actually wasn't. Um, so I could, you know, do the same, you know, uh, type of argument and say, well, why don't you apply your, your, your ad hominem arguments to the other side? It looks like she's only applying it to one side. So look, science is flawed. She understands that. We all understand that, but we can still learn from it. And, but sci more importantly, science doesn't grant us our rights. Our rights pre-exist the government. And, uh, you know, there should, we should not be guilty until proven innocent. On the contrary, we should be innocent until proven guilty. And that's how our legal system works in the United States, and rightly so. And that's how it should work going forward. Because look, the, the science is flawed. And so that, that shouldn't be used against us to take away our rights to educate our own children at home. And just imagine if you applied this guilty until proven, proven innocent logic to other areas of our life. If, if it's justified, if this is justified to uh, force us to send our kids to government-run schools or other types of schools, then why wait until the age of five years old? Are they going to call to give our kids to the government at age zero? Because kids are vulnerable between the ages of zero and five as well. So uh, are they also going to call to send our kids to the government at age zero? Because, well, if you have nothing to hide is the logic, then you should be more than happy to, to surrender your liberties to the government. And then why, why end at, at the age of 18? If, uh, you know, if you have nothing to hide, this can be applied to relationships too. Relationships uh, over the age of 18 have the risk of some form of abuse. And of course, we're not, uh, you know, defending that. But if there is some, you know, be, it, there is some risk for abuse happening, but does that mean that we should all have to go to government counselors, 100% of relationships, just because there might be a potential for abuse in relationships? I think everybody would think that would be ridiculous, and we shouldn't have to pay as taxpayers for those government bureaucrats, and we, and we shouldn't punish 100% of the population for the results of a few bad actors. But of course, if there is signs of abuse, then after the fact, the government should obviously come in and, and intervene. Uh, what's interesting in, in Elizabeth Bartlett's Harvard, uh, in her um, Arizona Law Review article, is that she, in her title, puts that she implies that parental rights are absolute and that people are arguing for uh, parental rights absolutism. But no one here on this panel is arguing that parents should have absolute rights over their children, that they should be able to abuse their children or harm their children or provide them with absolutely zero education. No one's arguing for that. We're just saying that a presumptive ban is ridiculous because it makes us all guilty until proven innocent. On the other hand, uh, you know, the government should have to prove to us why they should be able to take our kids away from us. That should always be the case, and that's how it currently is in the United States. And look, let's, let's imagine if we applied this argument to food. Um, you know, food is important for young children. We want, want them to be healthy, and there, there is a risk for abuse in the realm of food. Should we have government bureaucrats come to our dinner tables each day, and should we have to prove our innocence to them and show them, hey, look, he's eat, you know, my son's eating broccoli. Uh, you know, thank you. Have a nice day. I mean, the logic behind Elizabeth Bartlett is, well, well, if you don't have anything to hide and you're, you're, feed, you're feeding your child, um, you know, good food, then you shouldn't have anything to worry about with having government bureaucrats come into your homes for dinner each night. I would think that would be completely ridiculous. I think other people on this panel uh, think that's completely ridiculous. And I think the overwhelming population 
And looking at the response to the Harvard Magazine article shows that a lot of people think that we should be able to keep our liberties and that we should all be innocent until proven guilty. And again, we can go on and on and on with other examples. The Fourth Amendment would essentially be thrown out the door because, well, the, 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 the cops could say, well, we don't need a warrant because you don't have anything to hide, so we should be able to come into your house. And so we wouldn't be protected by unreason from unreasonable search and seizure. Same thing with the Fifth Amendment. Well, Corey, if you have nothing to hide, you shouldn't be able to take the take the fifth and, and you, you shouldn't have a right to remain silent is the argument because, well, if you have nothing to hide, then you shouldn't have anything to worry about. Same thing with stop and frisk policies. Um, stop and frisk policies, the idea behind that is that, well, if you have nothing to hide, if you don't have any drugs on you, you don't have a, a gun on you, then, then the cops should be able to stop you at random in the streets. But look, there's a lot of unintended consequences with these types of policies. And essentially, the people who advocate for these types of policies, I believe, uh, assume that the bureaucrats are benevolent and that they'll never make mistakes. But a lot of innocent people have been harmed from stop and frisk policies. The cop might have thought, for example, that the person had a gun when it was just an iPhone and that could result in the death of individuals. Again, similarly, I don't, I don't trust the government to have a perfect definition of what education ought to look like. And so what happens if you know, you try to make your case for evidence, for innocence to, to be able to homeschool your child. And then the bureaucrat says, well, you know, you don't, you're having a religious education. That's, you know, that's maltreatment and it's educational maltreatment. So you shouldn't be able to do that anymore. I think that would be a huge restriction on our liberties. And again, I don't trust the bureaucrats to figure out the food pyramid. I don't trust bureaucrats to figure out uh, a lot of other aspects of life. And I certainly don't figure that, you know, trust them to figure out what's best for my own child if they don't even know their names. And so again, I, I've gone a little bit over, but look, the main point here is that the whole thrust of Elizabeth Bartlett's argument is that a complete straw man, and no one here is arguing for absolute rights of parents. We're just arguing that the burden of proof should rightly remain on the government to be able to make a case to take away our rights to educate our own children at home. No one is arguing that abuse is okay. And essentially, unfortunately, uh, that title of that Arizona Law, Law Review made it past peer review, and that it essentially assumes uh, that and sets up a straw man that anyone is arguing for absolute rights over their children. Well, they're not. We're just arguing that the burden of proof should be on the government, should never be on the families. Our rights do not come from the government. They pre-exist the government. And the government should always have to prove to us why they should be able to take our rights away. Thank you. And next we have Mike Donnelly. Corey Deanne. Angeles. How you doing over there? <laughs> Corey, I so appreciate your energy and enthusiasm. Uh, thank you to Kevin Soling and my fellow panos who have been so eloquent. Um, and greetings to everyone watching and my fellow homeschoolers out there, especially to uh, my wife, Patricia, the homeschooling hero in our home of seven children, two, in two out of college, one in college, four to go. Pictures at Facebook, here comes the link. Looking for more friends, there you go. Um, I'm guessing it wasn't planned this way, but this Harvard controversy has come out of a, a little ironically, as Corey mentioned. I mean, every parent in America, practically, I, I think every America is, uh, I mean, the whole world, really, 1.5 billion children in 190 countries suddenly schooling at home, and Professor Bartholet says we should presume homeschooling should not be allowed. Well, I say we should presume that parents can be trusted, that they act in the best interests of their children. We should presume that people are innocent until proven guilty. We should presume that we, the people, can govern ourselves through state legislatures, not as Professor Bartholet recommends, through court decrees. In my remarks today, I can only respond to a sliver of Ms. Bartholet's inaccurate accusations. There are so many inaccuracies and allegations that time does not allow for them all to be addressed. It is concerning to me that Harvard is sponsoring such an exclusive conference that is so ideologically not diverse, like this panel, which is very ideologically diverse and diverse in many ways. Um, and uh, as an organization and personally, HSLDA supports, we, we support freedom of speech, we support freedom of association and academic freedom. So we're not saying the conference should not be held. You know, Corey, you said something about not fighting to the death. Well, in the army, we had a saying, I might disagree with everything you say, but I'll fight to the death. You're right to say it. And uh, I did serve in Iraq in, 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 uh, in combat. And uh, that's, that's what we used to say. 
So I think it's important that people be allowed to say what they think. So we're not calling on Professor Bartholay not to have her conference. In fact, the exposure of these ideas has been very helpful because it has sparked a debate about very important issues. In the articles and the conference materials, the organization I work for, HSL Day, was singled out as a powerful and scary lobbying organization that basically, as she says, aids and abets child abuse. Those are very troubling allegations. I think that it is malicious and it is false to suggest that HSL Day believes that parents have a right to abuse their children. We do not believe that. Child abuse is wrong. It is a crime. Government has a legitimate duty to protect children and punish criminals. Our work to support homeschooling freedom and to promote child welfare reform cannot reasonably be described as parental rights absolutism or support for child abuse. And as Pat Frank very well pointed out the history of homeschooling, when our organization was founded, homeschooling wasn't recognized legally in most states. People who wanted to homeschool were too scared to try for fear of criminal prosecution or worse, that CPS agencies might take their children. Our organization was one of a network of organizations of families and individuals to change these laws and to defend families. The success of the homeschooling community is remarkable. We're proud to serve this amazing community. Even if you wanna believe that HSLD is quote unquote powerful now, we were certainly nothing more than a David to the NEA Goliath in 1983. And even today we're tiny compared to the NEA and AFT who together oppose homeschooling. The real power of homeschooling, of the homeschooling movement, is in the people who do it. Even though Ms. Bartholay's factual assertions rely on opinion and conjecture, we're flattered to have been singled out by her as a powerful and effective lobbying association. And it's our privilege to stand with the homeschooling community to oppose unnecessary, unwarranted, or unreasonable constraints on their right to educate their children. It is true that HSLDA is a Christian organization. It's a large part of what motivates each one of us here at HSLDA to serve all families who make the sacrifice and investment to provide their children with the best home-based education possible. We want to serve all homeschooling families, regardless of their religious beliefs or non-belief. The lawyers and educational consultants here answer questions for tens of thousands of homeschooling families every year. We don't ask them if they're Christians when they answer, ask questions. We track hundreds of legislative proposals, and yes, we lobby and lead acti and actively oppose laws and regulations that would infringe on the rights of parents to freely homeschool. Our educational consultants are available to help homeschooling families with questions about how to get started, homeschooling from toddlers to tweens and through high school, homeschooling children with special needs, and so much more. We seek to be a resource to make homeschooling possible for any family that, that chooses to enjoy what Carrie McDonald has spoken about so eloquently, eloquently that homeschooling has to offer. In the article, Ms. Bartholay cites no legitimate empirical evidence for her negative claims about homeschooling. And there is substantial evidence to the contrary. Look at Dr. Joe Murphy's comprehensive literature, literature review, Homeschooling in America, shows that research shows that homeschooling produces individuals who are at least as well educated and well socialized as their public or private school counterparts. And there's a lot of research that shows that it's even better. An empirical study by University of Arkansas's Dr. Albert Chang suggests that homeschooling graduates are more politically tolerant than others. A literature review by Heritage Foundation's Dr. Lindsey Burke found that a majority of studies point to superior academic outcomes for homeschooling. And as Kerry pointed out, national surveys show how homeschooling is diversifying so broadly. This empirical evidence just blows up one of her arguments for this presumptive ban, which is her suspicion that all these homeschool homeschoolers who are Christians, which they're not, can't be trusted to raise democratic citizens. What Ms. Bartholay wants is for the state through its government schools, thank you, Corey, for pointing that out, to be primarily responsible for creating democratic citizens. But this idea has been rejected by the US Supreme Court. In 1922, the United States Supreme Court threw out an Oregon law that said you can't use private schools. And it said in a landmark ruling, the state cannot standardize its children by forcing them to instruct, accept instruction for public schools only. The child is not the mere creature of the state. Parents have a high duty to recognize and prepare the child for additional obligations. In 1979, Parham v. J.R., the Supreme Court said, fit parents are deemed to act in the best interest of their children. Isn't that our American tradi tradition? 
that we presume parents can be trusted, that people are innocent until they're proven guilty. Why should that be different in this context? She says, as Carrie pointed out, the US Constitution is an anomaly. She invokes the, Const the Colombian Constitution and the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child to support her argument. And even if her opinion about the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child were accurate, which it isn't, there's a lot of great weight from other binding treaties of international law that support protecting parental rights in education. The modern international homeschool human rights movement was started in response to what happened in World War II. And virtually every major international human rights treaty recognized that parents are endowed with the right to direct their children's education. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights was a foundational document to these treaties. In Article 16.3, it says that the Universal says that families are the fundamental group unit of society. They're entitled to protection. And in 26.3, that parents have a prior right to choose the kind of education that shall be given to their children. This was written specifically in response to what happened in Germany when Hitler took over the whole education system in order to immerse children in national socialist values. Let me be clear, I am not in any way trying to link Professor Bartha Ley to German national socialism. I'm sure she would denounce that. But her proposal for a presumptive ban on home education so that the state can educate children in accordance with state approved values sounds too similar to the methods used by these, this group and others in history to achieve such nefarious ends to escape comparison. It's undeniable that public education is a significant function of modern government and therefore should give children an opportunity to gain an education so they can participate as literate and productive citizens in a Republican society. But in a Republic, the only way to preserve freedom is to preserve the role and authority of parents, especially against government as the primary decision makers for children. The more parents play a role in education and the lives of children, the better for the children and our society. Professor Bartholay says we should presume that homeschooling shouldn't be allowed, but I say we should presume that parents can be trusted and that they already act in the best interests of their children. Thank you so much for listening. I wanna turn it over now to Brian Connor, who is the president of the National Youth Rights Association. Brian? Yeah. Thank Thank you. Hey, uh, yeah, so I'm uh, from the National Youth Rights Association. We're a civil rights organization advocating for equal rights for young people. And yeah, so I mean, our take on this is that the whole way this is framed by Bartholay and even a lot of advocates for homeschooling is that it's a question of the rights of parents versus the government. And we think that's unfair to the young people themselves because young people are their own human beings. They have their own views, their own um, opinions about things, their own personalities, and they're completely their own people. So really the focus of this should be on the young people themselves having the right to whatever kind of education, whatever kind of life they want for themselves. And that's, yeah, I mean, even something that was at one point um, acknowledged by the US Supreme Court um, in 1967, they said that constitutional rights do not stop at the schoolhouse gate. Uh, so that means that young people in school, in theory, should have the same rights that they do outside. But really, the rights in both of these places are almost non-existent. Um, they just fundamentally don't have the, these fundamental constitutional rights and civil rights and civil liberties to make decisions for themselves. Um, and over the years, these, um, this just lack of rights in schools and, and especially has gotten worse in a lot of ways. And we believe that this is uh, because of ageism, because of the just prejudice against young people and the belief that they're not capable human beings. Um, so yeah, we believe that the best way to grant them these rights and for them to learn how to exercise these rights in their youth and as they grow into adults is for them to learn in an environment that emulates and respects these rights instead of one that disregards them by claiming that young people can't understand them. So 
Yeah, I mean, it's just like Kevin, um, and, I mean, and all of you kind of touched on all sorts of these rights violations in schools that would just be considered abusive if they were happening in pretty much any other environment. So, so I mean, students spend um, like basically a majority of their waking hours in a classroom, but they have basically no say in what happens in that classroom, what they're learning. Uh, corporal punishment is still legal in a lot of states. Um, lots of, um, most schools have some form of dress code, which restricts, restricts what they can wear and is often racist and sexist. Um, then they don't have the right to free speech um, and uh, they're often forced to say the Pledge of Allegiance and the National Anthem. Um, in general, there's, I mean, all sorts of punishment stuff um, for, yeah, that just wouldn't be considered humane in any other environment since youth aren't choosing to be here in the first place. So there's, it's really not fair to be punishing them for not following these rules that they didn't agree to to begin with. Um, and they don't have the right to their own property at the school, their lockers, and um, even their own bodies can usually be searched by um, school police officers. Um, there are also, um, schools often try to block students from organizing and starting clubs. Um, students very rarely have representation on the school board or the right to vote in elections which determines the people who run this whole system and uh, students especially disabled students are often um, put in seclusion which has like Kevin mentioned has been deemed illegal for prisoners but we still feel like it's okay to put students in solitary confinement um, so really all of this comes from the idea that students are just too lazy to control their own learning and that their interests are trivial. They're cajoled, threatened, and punished into learning in ways that are determined by others instead of themselves, but it really doesn't have to be that way. So uh, one of Naira's positions is expanding academic freedom to all students, um, and this improves learning as well. Uh, Peter Gray, who's going to speak after me, has done all sorts of studies on this that show that like, I mean, some of you, um, Corey, you mentioned studies showing that, like, um, generally homeschooling has, I mean, is more like educationally beneficial to students than um, public schools, but um, specifically about, um, like, self-directed education where students are just totally making all of these decisions for themselves. Uh, and Peter can speak more on this after, like 100% of the time, basically, um, these students are happy with the way they've learned and report as adults that they're happy with what they've learned. And these include students in pretty much every um, disadvantaged group. Um, there are, yeah, all sorts of um, women and people of color and LGBTQIA plus folks and disabled students who unschool or go to democratic schools and almost all of them um like peter uh yeah peter studies have shown have said that this is beneficial and they're happy about it the very few who were not i mean who said that they'd rather not have unschooled um said that they would have chosen to go to school themselves which means that they would have made and that like their parents pressured them to um unschool, which means that they would have made that decision themselves. So we can really trust young people to make whatever the right decision for them is. Um, and these could even be things that just totally break down the barriers of like, what are ideas at, of the differences between being in school and not being in school are. Like if you really just trust each individual person to make their own decisions. Um, the possibilities there are endless. Uh, yeah, so next on the subject of all that research Peter has done, I'm going to turn it over to him. Okay. Hey, um, let's see, am I? 
on the screen now. I don't see anything. So um, let me just get the right view here. I guess I'm not, there we go, speaker view. Okay, so um, the um, disadvantage of going last and all the, also the advantage of going last is that everything has been set. So I, am, uh, I may be able to fill in a few things that are relevant. Um, I wanted to say, start off by saying that I too forced myself through that 80 page uh, Arizona review article. I even read some of the footnotes and I tried to track it down and I agree with pretty much everything that's been said about that article. It's amazing to me that it was published in uh, apparently respectable uh, journal. It's amazing to me that somebody who would write this would be um, a professor at Harvard. Uh, maybe it's not so surprising, I don't know. So the title of this, uh, uh, that, this article that everybody's talking about, this 80 page article, is parent rights absolutism, child rights to education and protection. I wanna take those three words, child rights, education and protection. And I wanna comment on each of those things. First of all, from the point of view of Bartlett, what she has to say about child rights, education and protection. And then from the point of view of uh, common sense. So the first, uh, let's start with child's rights. So from Bartlett's uh, point of view, and she's not the only one who argues this. And in fact, the, uh, the UN uh, Convention for the Rights of the Child says the same thing. It says that it is the right of the child to have a compulsory education. The right of the child, think about that for a moment. The right of the child to have a compulsory education. Orwellian doublespeak, if there ever was. You know, compulsory education, if it means anything, means forced education, right? That's what the word compulsory means, it's forced. You don't have a choice about it. So whether you want it or not, you have the right <laughs> to this, but you don't have the right to refuse it. You have, it's, it's very similar to saying that um, you have the right to be a slave. <laughs> and you have to be a slave, <laughs> right? I mean, that's the, that, that kind of language. How do we talk that way? Are we allowed to talk that way because we're talking about children? Do we not regard children as human beings like other human beings? Do we take away the rights of people or do we have a completely different sense of what rights are when we're talking about children? Than, we're than when we're talking about people who are above some certain arbitrary age that we define as adulthood. You know, human rights are the bedrock of the human, of the, of the US Constitution. You know, Jefferson declared in the Bill of Rights that the unalienable human right of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. The Bill of Rights in the Constitution is designed to ensure freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of assembly, and the right to liberty, which is really the fundamental right that enables all of the other rights to be true. Children in school are obviously being deprived of their liberty. They're being deprived of their liberty more than anybody else is deprived in any other setting, including prisoners when they're in prison. Children have no liberty in school. There is no due process in school. Children are being told all the time exactly what to do. They're being micromanaged in a way that no adult would put up with. Sometimes it's sad that being in school is like a job for adults and it's good training for children because it's like a job. There's certain hours of it and so on and so forth. I've asked many adults, would you accept a job that involves this amount of micromanaging? Would you accept a job in which you have to ask permission to go to the bathroom? Would you accept a job in which you are constantly being compared, constantly being compared 
to all of your social, all of, all of your coworkers to see who's better or who's worse. Would you accept that kind of a job? No adult would tolerate that kind of a job. And yet we force our children to go to school. And some people argue that we shouldn't have the choice to not send them to this kind of a setting. School has always been like this, but it's worse today than, in the, than it was in the past, as Brian pointed out. And the reason it's worse today is because there's more of it. It used to be more tolerable because the school day was shorter, the school year was longer. When I was in school, the school year was five weeks shorter than it is today. We had recess in elementary school. We had two hours outdoors out of the six hour school day, half hour recess in the middle of the morning, half hour in the afternoon, full hour at lunch. We've taken all that away. We have, uh, we have increased homework in ele even elementary school, even kindergarten kids are being forced to take homework and parents have to, have to sign off on this homework so parents get involved. You're not free of school even when you're home. School has taken over children's lives. Is this really education that's occurring? <laughs> is this all for the sake of education? How much learning is really occurring as a result of all of this? You know, we've gone berserk with school, absolutely berserk with it. I, I wrote a little blog post about, the, the, about how the kindergarten teachers in, um, and then in, a neighboring, um, in, the, in the neighboring town to where I live had uh, been, re, been protesting the fact that they are being required by the higher up administrators to do things that they believe are abusive to the kindergarten children. And I wrote a blog post about it, and I got hundreds of responses to that from kindergarten teachers all over the country who say they're on the verge of quitting or have quit or are going to quit because what they're being forced to do to little children. Can we blame parents for taking their children out of that kind of a setting? So that's the, that's the situation we're in. The school year has gotten longer. The school day has gotten longer. We're doing all this high pressure testing. We've taken away the creative things that used to occur in school. So because somehow we've defined education as doing well on these stupid tests. Test scores have become the definition of good education. And everybody's being given the same test, regardless of who you are, regardless of what your interests are, regardless of your predispositions, as if, as if we are all identical and we're all supposed to be identical. And the measure of us is those test scores. And teachers are being evaluated on the test scores. Schools are being evaluated on the test scores. The result of that is schools have become places of child abuse. And I will say that over and over and over again. Schools are places of child abuse. What is happening in school is child abuse. It's most obvious with the little kids and the teachers are recognizing that this is happening. It's a little bit less obvious with the older kids, but it is there. So let me give you some of the data on what's happening. So, you know, this is, this is data that's well established by good scientific studies. It doesn't get out there in the public very much but it should, these are things that everybody should know. So first of all, the, the, there was a large scale study a few years ago using what's called an experience sampling method with hundreds of, these were middle school age children from many different schools. And basically what happens in this study is a beeper goes off at random times during the day. And when the beeper goes off, you indicate how your mood at that time and what you're doing and where you are. And the finding from that study was that when children are in, when these young people were in school, that's when they were least happy, most angry, most anxious, and most bored. Who believes that a setting in which children are unhappy, angry, anxious, and bored is the ideal place for an education? That's absurd. We know this. Nobody's surprised by that data. Everybody knows that. Everybody who's been to school knows that. This is not surprising data. What's surprising is we don't make any connection. This is not the kind of setting where children should be put, and certainly not the kind of setting that's good for learning. Children learn when they're happy. Children learn when they're excited. Children learn 
when they can do what they want to do and that's not possible with the structure of the schools that we have. No matter how good the teacher is, no matter how committed the teacher is, no matter how much the teacher loves children and believes in children, most, pe most teachers do, but they're in a setting in which attending to the real needs of the child is not possible. It is possible at home and parents recognize that. It is possible when you, can, when you can respond to the real needs of the child in ways that teachers in school cannot as much as they might want to. There's another study that, you know, a, a few years ago, this was, it was about four or five years ago, the American Psychological Association conducted a study of stress in America. They found the most stressed out people in America are teenagers, middle school and high school age kids. The most stressed out people in America. Why should that be? And when they were asked the source of their stress, 83% of them said school. 83% of them said school. Moreover, they did this study, in some cases they were asking the kids during the summer when they were not in school, and they were asking, over the past week, have you experienced severe stress? When they did, when they asked the question in the summer, it was 13% who said in the past week they experienced severe stress. When they asked the question during the school year, it was 27% who experienced severe stress. We all know that suicides are going up among school aged children, going up quite dramatically. In fact, they've been going up for a long time as over many years, school has become more and more weighty, more and more abusive and the school and the suicide rate has been going up. Now, when people talk about suicides among young people, they all, among children, they, they seem to mention almost everything except school. They think it's due to social media, video games, uh, the fears about the larger world and so on and so forth. But if you ask kids, they say it's school. And here's some data that everybody ought to know. The suicide rate among school aged children when school is in session during the school year is double what the rate is when school is not in session. For kids who are over 18 and not in school, there's no difference between summer and, and winter in the, rate of, in the rate of suicide. The rate of mental hospital admissions is double for school-aged children for mental health crisis, is double during the school year than when school is not in session. These data ought to be alarming. We should all know this. Every school official should be concerned about this. I heard a talk by uh, the superintendent of schools of a major city recently was concerned. She was asked the question about suicide. She mentioned every single possible cause of children's suicide except the pressure and, and, the, and the anxiety that is created by school. We are in a state of denial about this. We've got to face the facts. We are hurting children in school. Schools have become places of child abuse, state-sponsored, state-mandated almost child abuse. And now here we have this proposal that would really make it state-mandated by depriving parents of the right to not send their child to that abusive institution. I want now to say something about education, just a few words about education. You know, we make the assumption that what schools do is educate, but, but what is education? What really is education? I've given a lot of thought to that. I'm, the, at the Alliance for Self-Directed Education, we've given some thought about how we would define education. And here's what we've come up with. And I think, I think this is a common sense definition of education that almost anybody would agree with. Education is the sum of everything a person learns that enables that person to live a satisfying and meaningful life. And maybe I should add a moral life to that. Everything a person learns that enables that person to live a satisfying, meaningful, and moral life. How much of that is learned in school? And how much of that is learned in life? And if children are going to learn those things in life, they need a life outside of school. They need a life that's not dominated by school and not dominated by school-like things. We need to provide children with the opportunities to really grow. 
almost nothing. You know, there's some evidence that there's, there's some research that suggests that about 5% of what children are taught in school, they actually remember. I'm a little surprised it's even 5%. One of the things that we're learning, there are articles that, that we see now that parents who are trying to help their kids, even their very young kids, with homework online, they don't know, they don't know this stuff. <laughs> Isn't that ironic? Here's, here's parents who are liars and doctors and very successful in the world, and, and here's this stuff that, they're, that the children are supposed to be learning and is regarded as so important and they're being tested on it and they're going to fail if they don't test on it. And these successful parents don't know what it is. Well, apparently, it's not all that important for everybody to know. You know, that we have this idea that education is this single track, that everybody's supposed to be on the same track, that everybody's supposed to learn the same things. And what those things are is just a narrow, tiny sliver of all there is to know out there. There's no way we could all learn it all. Wouldn't we have a better society if we recognize that different people, that, that education is not a same track, that everybody should be on the same track, that it's more like a bush, you know, I'm out on this branch here and you're out on that branch there and I'm pursuing my interests and you're pursuing your interests. And then we have a society that, that there's a lot of different people doing a lot of different things. Isn't that a more interesting society than if everybody were the same and doing the same thing? And yet school is so oriented towards making everybody the same. We even drug people who are different. If, if you're different enough that you don't fit in quite with school, instead of saying that school is an unhealthy environment, we say that the kid has a mental illness, a mental disorder, ADHD, or whatever the heck it is, and we give them powerful drugs. 20% of, of boys in school at some point are diagnosed with ADHD. I mean, this is outrageous what is happening. And so I clearly, you know, I should, I should bring it to a close, but there, there's just another, one more point I wanna make before ending this, and that has to do, some other people have made this point, but I wanna make it with the actual data. So Bartlett, you know, keeps saying, she, she says, she, her, her use of the word many, she says, she says or, or the other thing she says often is something like, most and possibly 90% of people who choose homeschooling are choosing homeschooling for Christian religious reasons. And then she has the implication that they're choosing for Christian religious reasons to prevent their children from learning things rather than be that, uh, that that's sort of what Christian religious reason would be, that they're choosing it. You know, there was a time when homeschooling was dominated by, uh, by people doing it for Christian. That's no longer true, and the data show that it's not true. Uh, the most objective data come from the U.S. Department of Education uh, surveys that they do, polls that, surveys that they do every four years, a survey of a, a, a normal, uh, a scientifically selected sample of families to see where their children are going to school and why. And they have questions for those who are homeschooling their children about their reason for homeschooling. And the primary reason for homeschooling, as I think Carrie mentioned and a couple, maybe a couple other people mentioned, is concern about the school environment, the belief that the school environment is not safe. There's a lot of reasons why they might think that the school environment is not safe. So 74% cited that as a reason and 29% cited that as the major reason. That, that led the whole list of all possible reasons. That was the number one reason. Number two reason is dissatisfied with the instruction that occurs there. That, doesn't, that could mean a lot of different things, but it could very well mean that you just don't think that what is being taught in your school, in that school, is the most important thing for your child to learn. You might believe that your child should be learning things that your child wants to learn, or that would make more sense to your child, or that are more relevant to your child, and so on and so forth. So you'd be dissatisfied with the academic instruction that's occurring there. 61% cited that as a reason, and 20% cited that as the major reason. So we've got, we've got already that uh, that approximately half are citing either the this, this lack of school safety or the, or, the, or the inadequacy of the academic instruction at school as the major reason. Now, religious instruction, 44% cited that as a reason. 
note that's less than half are citing, even citing it as a reason, one of many reasons, even only 44%, only 12% cited that as the major reason, only 12%. And yet Bartlett is making out as if they're all, you know, all like 90% would be, would, be, would be doing it for that. I mean, it just defies understanding how she could distort the data to, to such a degree. All right, so I'm going to bring it to a close now, but I, I really hope that we will come to our senses about education. We have gone on, you know, sometimes, sometimes societies, whole cultures go on a track that is historically determined and people fail to question it. You know, we had foot binding in China. It went on for centuries, you know, until people came to their senses and said that girls are going to be better, grow up better off if they're if they can walk <laughs> and run and their feet aren't bound. I think of what we're doing with our schooling is comparable to that. We are binding our children. We are preventing our children from being who they are by forcing them into so much compulsory restrictive schooling where their own curiosity doesn't count, where they are taught not to be curious because curiosity is a distraction, where they're taught not to play. Play and curiosity are the way children are designed to learn. And yet, we've, and yet our schools take play and curiosity away. So quite contrary to the view that not sending your child to school is abusive. I believe that sending your child is in many cases abusive. And I'm the last speaker. So yeah, so we're gonna open the, uh, the floor to uh, Q&A. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, thank all of the speakers. I really appreciate everyone volunteering their time uh, to come and speak on such an important issue. Uh, it's uh, unfortunate that there's no way to uh, applaud, but if people want to applaud in their home, I'd like to thank once again, the speakers, Kerry McDonald, Patrick Ferenga, Michael Donnelly, Corey DeAngelis, Brian Connor, and Peter Gray. And uh, I've got a few questions um, that uh, I can start with, which I will throw out to uh, the panel and anyone can jump in uh, and answer. And if people want to ask more questions, I will uh, look at them uh, as best as I can uh, while we're you know, back and forth. So, so the first uh, question is, how do you address accusations of class bias given that single parent households and people of limited means will have a much harder time pursuing other options for education? I guess um, all right. Uh, I, I'll I'll take a crack at that. Single parents can and do homeschool, um, you know, but it's difficult, no doubt. But they usually enlist uh, another a relative, a grandparent, or their their mother, or something like that, to uh, to help them out um, with the child care. Um, what you know, it's I I I don't feel it's class bias because it's self-selecting and no one's preventing her from coming out because of, uh, of where she is. In fact, uh, that's one of the things that I find surprising um, about some comments about homeschooling is that, um, you know, people forget that there are people, you know, who are poor, who are, um, you know, not, not as educated as, uh, you know, schools would like to see their, their homeschooling parents be. And they're doing a fine job. In fact, Barclay cites parents who can't um, read and write, you know. And it's back in, we have stories in Growing Without Schooling, a couple of parents who admitted that they, they, they faked their way through math in school and couldn't properly make change. And it was when they learned to math alongside their children that they finally got it. You can learn things by teaching them too. That's, a, that's an irony. But yeah, I would like to see more support so that single parents could homeschool. And um, that might, you know, that's a big discussion about, you know, schools and vouchers perhaps, or, or, or other ways of making things work. But um, you don't have to wait for that to happen. I'm not gonna say it's gonna be easy, but there are single parents who do homeschool. Yeah, and just to add on that really quickly, since you talked about vouchers, I, I think this is really an argument for education savings accounts 
uh, which allow the, the, the family to, the money to follow the child into an education savings account. Instead of being in the form of a voucher where you can only use it for a private school, you can use these funds in the education savings account for homeschooling expenses, virtual schooling, private schooling, and it really gets us from school choice to education choice. And I will you know, point out that some homeschool families uh, don't like the idea of education savings accounts because it could lead to government uh, regulation of homeschooling. And that's absolutely a possibility. But if there's no other way to uh, incur the cost of homeschooling and, and, and to be able to practice homeschooling, I think they're a good option. And, you know, each individual family should be able to make that decision for themselves. They should be able to make that cost benefit decision of, you know, are the regulations worth it or not? Uh, but but I don't believe any homeschooling group should be pushing against any of those individual families to be able to make their own decisions for themselves. And so I, that's another benefit of school choice in that all these programs are voluntary. Each individual family can choose whether the, the, the costs of regulations are worth the benefits. Kevin, I'd just like to jump in real quick with a quick clarification, if I could. Um, one little point to the, to the question questioner about class bias, which I think maybe gets at education bias. I just wanted to point out that there is some research that indicates there is no correlation between the academic outcomes that are observed in homeschooling and the credentials or education levels of the parents. Uh, so for people who may not have been able to attain a high level of education, uh, homeschooling is still accessible. And for all the reasons that Dr. Grace so wonderfully majestic, majestically and you know, described, it's a good thing for parents to do, forget about uh, even the academic stuff. There's a lot of things to be avoided in the current system. I'll also add that we have um, availability of hybrid homeschooling options, of self-directed learning centers, for example, that tend to be third or even a quarter private options. So, you know, certainly not free. And I would also support education savings accounts for families that want them. Um, but there are some of these low cost um, hybrid homeschool models that allow parents to continue to work and uh, still appreciate much of the freedom and flexibility of the homeschooling lifestyle. Right. And I mean, a lot of these centers are like, I mean, have like a sliding tuition where they just don't turn families away because of how much they make. Um, and then, I mean, even in terms of the unschooling, there have been like studies done on unschooling families showing that like a large portion of them make less than $25,000 a year. Um, and also, I mean, the whole self-directed education movement was made for low-income students. Like, I mean, a lot of this can be um, traced back to Francisco Ferrer Gardia, who uh, ran a democratic school in Spain at the like turn of the century. Um, and his whole goal with that was in kind of like empowering um, economically disadvantaged people to basically overthrow the ruling class. And that's where so much of this movement really got its start. And a lot of like other democratic schools were inspired from that. And like when democratic schools have been founded that um, like uh, kind of cater to mm -hmm. Um, more rich students and don't have that sliding tuition, uh, like advocates in the movement have like gotten really mad about that and spoken out. And especially, I mean, considering that like the school, the main, the like public school system was designed to basically keep um, low income students down and kind of teach them to conform to the class hierarchy and stuff. There's um, definitely recommend checking out um, the underground history of American education by John Tyler Gato um, is a, great book about that. I could add uh, one, one more uh, thought to this, that the, we at the Alliance for Self-Directed Education have a part of our mission is to make uh, educational opportunities outside of for schooling available to um, everyone. <laughs> um, that's a big mission. We're not close to it yet. But one of the ways we're working towards that mission is by working with libraries. So I'm not against uh, government support. <laughs> I'm for government support for libraries. Uh, <laughs> I believe in libraries. Uh, libraries are great places for self-directed education. And we're working towards, we're, we're work, working with librarians and we're working towards trying to get grants to allow libraries to become basically learning centers. Uh, learning centers that operate on the principle of a library. You go to the library and the librarian doesn't tell you what to do, what to read, what you've got to read. The librarian wants to know what you want to do and helps you do it. 
And so that's the uh, principle of self-directed education. What uh, my basic thesis is, is that children come into the world biologically designed to educate themselves. We don't have to pass, you know, education is not a passive thing that's done to children. It's something they do for themselves. Ch and when children are free to play and explore and follow their own interests, they educate themselves in the process of doing that. And what we need to do is to provide the opportunities for them to do that in, a, in an educationally rich environment, no matter what their home is. And so by making libraries an educationally rich environment, that would be one way to, ac to accomplish that and make it available for everybody. So I'd like to address a couple of things. So some people are asking where they can watch this later. And yes, the event is being recorded. Uh, if you go on Facebook and uh, you go to uh, search ideological diversity uh, at the Harvard Kennedy School, um, it'll either be there or a link or information will be there on, on where to watch it. Um, another question is, uh, where can people go to get resources? Oh, one, one place they can go is to the, um, depending on the kind of resources you're looking for, but we have actually a resource directory, a searchable resource directory on the website for the uh, Alliance for Self-Directed Education, where you can find all kinds of resources uh, that are useful for, um, for uh, educational purposes. You can also check out youthrights.org. Um, it has a section on student rights, kind of covering each student rights issue and uh, kind of what the laws are and what you can do about it. Uh, there's also like an activist toolkit section that has a lot more information on how you can take action, including a page on how you can, um, yeah, start unschooling and stuff. Well, I hate to admit it, or maybe I shouldn't hate to admit it, but I think Google is a place to start. <laughs> the problem with Google is that you can get lost because there are so many resources that are out there. And, um, you know, the thing is, you know, for anybody who wants to homeschool, um, I understand, you know, financial is, a re is an issue sometimes, but it can be done. If you want to do it, you can do it. And you can encourage and help your, your friends and neighbors and family members who want to do it as well. Uh, there, there are resources, there are human resources available, there are organizations available, like Peter's organization, our organization. Um, Carrie, I hope you're going to jump in here to talk about what you're doing with your unschooling.com thing. There's commercial adventures. There's so much support and so much resource available. Uh, sometimes you can get paralysis by analysis or there's too much to choose from. But don't let that stop you. I figure this is an opportunity for everyone to jump in and kind of. I was going to say. Uh, uh, well, since we're mentioning websites, um, you know, all the issues of Growing Without Schooling magazine, uh, videos of John Holt, myself, interviews, podcasts, books and materials that we carry through the John Holt uh, bookstore, and some more recent things that, that I've come across are all uh, just listed listed there. Um, you know, and the, it's all free. So johnholtgws.com. And uh, I look forward to updating that in the coming months. It's, it's, uh, it's old, but it's, it's still very useful. <laughs> and if Kevin, sharing, my, uh, my PR director would, say, oh, sorry, Carrie, go ahead. No, I'll just say if we're sharing resources, I'll just say my book, Unschooled, Raising Curious, Well-Educated Children Outside the Conventional Classroom, came out last May, but has had resurgence of interest, given that we have 50 million homeschoolers now, and or school at homers uh, um, through the COVID-19 pandemic. So go ahead and check that out. Uh, and you can find me and all my writing at fee.org slash carry. And hey, I, I, Kevin, that HSLDA has created a website, especially for people who are suddenly schooling at home called mompossible.org. And it's designed for people who aren't currently homeschooling to encourage them and give them some access to resources. There's also a Facebook group called Hashtag Learn Everywhere, which is put out by an organization called Yes Every Kid, um, which is not HSLDA, Yes Every Kid, uh, which is designed to help people figure out where they can start. So Learn Everywhere or mompossible.org. I think Learn Everywhere has like over 13,000 families who've kind of come come together spontaneously during the pandemic to figure out how to adjust to the school closures. Just for everybody, I, I just now shared a link to Carrie's book in the comments. It's only $11.99, well worth the read. 
uh, definitely check that out um, as well. And then Carrie's also, she should have mentioned this, but she has a whole list of resources at the Cato Institute website as well, which I'll share right after I say this. Um, but things like Khan Academy, TED Ed, a whole bunch of different free online resources to help you uh, adjust to the school closures and, and kind of adjust to homeschooling as well. Uh, yeah, the National Youth Rights Association's website, again, is youthrights.org. So, um, yeah, all, all these links and, and more will be made available on the Facebook site, so you can, you know, start there and jump to all the, the different places. So I will, I will give all the uh, participants, the panel members, opportunities to include as, as, as much as they want there to, to direct them to additional resources. Uh, Let's see, we got, um, uh, how are people with special needs supposed to get the resources they need outside of the traditional government schools? Well, I'll just jump in on that real quick. I, I look forward to other people's comments, but a lot of states do allow and support homeschoolers uh, to get special education resources from the public schools. Um, you know, for those who don't want that, and there, there are many who don't want to, they leave the public school because they don't want to have any more interaction with it, um, especially because they have children who have not been treated well or have not been provided for well uh, who have special needs. But a lot of times you can get those special education services that the schools provide from private insurance if you have uh, medically. So there are a number of different resources where you can get these kinds of occupational therapy or physical therapy uh, or those kinds of education uh, supports that you would otherwise get through special education in schools. Schools also have to provide an, educate, an IEP for parents. So that's something that schools are obligated to do by law, by federal law. So if you have a special uh, education student and you want an IEP to help diagnose a learning disability uh, or to find out what you know, would provide for that child, Schools have to have to do that. Um, so it's just a couple of ideas. One thing I can comment on is um, a lot of the things that get diagnosed as special needs or learning disabilities and so on are really uh, problems adjusting to school. So ADHD is a classic example of that. You know, almost all of it is diagnosed because I, I did an informal study of. Uh, just a poll of uh, people who took their school, their child out of school who had a diagnosis of ADHD. And I asked them, so how did the kid do after leaving school? And almost all of them said they could go off the drugs, they didn't have any trouble concentrating, they were learning, they were happier. Not all of them, but, but the great majority of them said. There's also dyslexia, it's very over diagnosed in school. Um, people think it's a brain disorder, but very, and maybe in some cases it is, but that's not the basis for the diagnosis. And um, basically, if somebody hasn't learned how to, how, to, how to read by the time they should have learned how to read, they're kind of in trouble, and at some point they get diagnosed with dyslexia. And I've begun to look at that. Um, you know, I've done I've done some research uh, on um, people who attended the Sudbury Valley School and people who are doing unschooling. These are people in charge of their own education. I have yet to find anybody who hasn't learned to read. Uh, they some of them learn to read at much later ages. And uh, but I think that the if you think about it, learning to read in school is the very worst situation for learning to read, just like it's the worst situation to learn anything. You're under pressure. You know, you want to learn something where you're comfortable, where you feel loved, where you feel uh, cared for, where you're not going to be shamed if you're not good at it. So your kid in school, and for whatever reason, who knows what the reason is, learning reading is a little more difficult for you. I was, and uh, so, so you kind of freeze up about it. And I think a lot of the cases of dyslexia are that case. And I've heard of many cases. I, uh, for example, you know, I did this study of uh, graduates of the Sudbury Valley School years ago. And this is a school for self-directed education. It's called a school, but it's nothing like school. Kids are playing and explore and do their own thing. And, and among the graduates were two kids who had a diagnosis of dyslexia when they were in public school. Both of them came at age 15. Both of them said that, told me that they learned how to read within a few months of being at the school. 
more informally, I've heard of many such reports. Uh, so I don't want to say it doesn't exist. There are probably some people who have a real problem learning to read, but the great majority of people with a diagnosis of dyslexia can learn how to read. And, and, and the easiest way for them to learn how to read is to let them do it in their own way. Give them the opportunity in, in a relaxed and comfortable environment where there's no pressure about it. Right, and even, oh. Oh. yeah, even students with like, quote unquote, like severe learning disabilities are still their own full human beings and stuff. And yeah, you should still listen to them and give them what they want and what they need because I mean, schools don't listen to them. They just, yeah, think that um, because of their disabilities, they're not able to make decisions from themselves. And unfortunately, lots of parents have that mindset too, that um, they need to make these decisions for um, their children because of their disability or whatever. But really none of that is true. They're still humans and they deserve um, rights, as, the same rights as any other youth to make their own decisions and the same rights as any adult. So we're, uh, we're just about out of time. Um, there's only three minutes left. So I, I thought it might be an uh, opportunity if everyone wants to make any kind of closing statement, closing point. Um, and, uh, you know, again, I, I appreciate everyone's participation. I guess I can start just really quickly. Um, this is Corey DeAngelis again. And I mean, one of the biggest backlashes here is that, uh, that article, uh, to that article from Harvard Magazine, The Risk of Homeschooling. And, you know, this is really based on Elizabeth Bartholet's article, the, you know, in the Arizona Law Review. And look, a lot of her arguments are based on just using the words many and some and not really claiming, you know, backing up her, her claims with statistics. Um, and, and she really painting with a wide brush to make homeschool families look like they're all abusing their kids and not providing them with an education. So I would encourage everybody to look at the evidence. It actually tends to be positive for homeschooling. And even if it wasn't positive, that's another big takeaway. Even if the evidence wasn't positive, doesn't mean we should have a presumptive ban on homeschooling. Our rights pre-exist the government and science isn't what grant, grants us rights because there are so many issues with science and because it's imperfect. And because, you know, you can't even get experts to agree on what the science actually says. Uh, and look, even more concerning here behind this presumptive ban on homeschooling is the idea that we are all guilty until proven innocent, which is not the case in the United States. And we should push back hard against that because even if you're not a homeschooler, this could, you know, lead to arguments to take away other rights. Uh, just, you know, about just even like giving your kids uh, a proper meal at the end of the day or government intervening within your relationships or government intervening before the age of five or government taking away your right to, uh, you know, the Fourth Amendment right and the Fifth Amendment right. So these arguments can be made, the, the same arguments that are being made by Elizabeth Bartholet can be applied to other areas of life. So even if you're not a homeschooler, you need to be paying attention to these arguments and push back. Thank you. I'll also just add that I think for those of us who, you know, have come into homeschooling over the last, uh, you know, 10 or 15 years with younger children, we have really had it easy thanks to many of the homeschooling pioneers uh, that have paved the way and made uh, homeschooling a much easier battle for us that we don't have to think too much of it. And now might be our moment to make sure that these rights are retained and preserved and that we continue to fight for the, uh, the right to make sure that we are raising and educating our children as we see fit. And I just want to say thank you, Kevin, for pulling all this together once again. Great job. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I've, I've seen um, lots of comments in the chat asking like what this looks like as a movement and like what the next steps are. And uh, yeah, I mean, I was, my position is that like, I mean, as well as, um, unschooling and democratic schools and stuff being better educationally just the current school system just is a violation of people's basic human rights so we think that the best next steps for this are to come at it from that perspective and try to change um public opinion and public policy so that um yeah just from a 
perspective as of basic human rights that are being violated. So if you're interested in helping out with this, um, there are lots of ways you can sign up on our website to help out. Uh, we've got a newsletter and a um, page to sign up to volunteer and uh, or to donate or to start a local um, chapter. So yeah, really, however you're interested in helping out with this movement, um, Naira can give you support on that. Well, thank you uh, so much, Kevin, and uh, to my fellow panelists. It's a privilege for me to be on this panel uh, with all of you. I have such great regard and respect for each one of you and the work you do to support uh, families who are choosing to educate their children outside of school, at home, with whatever methodology they choose and whatever motivation they choose. Um, it's a privilege for me to serve that community at HSLDA. And again, Kevin, thank you for your leadership and for uh, contributing your voice against uh, this um, craziness. Thank you. I might just comment, I too am delighted to be on this panel. And, and I might point out, as I think somebody else pointed out, on probably any other issue, we would be in great disagreement among ourselves. We're politically diverse. We're, <laughs> we're, uh, we're, we're philosophically diverse in many, many ways. I know Carrie and I, for example, if we were to argue some things, we would be, we would be very respectful, but we would disagree. But here's something that we, um, we all agree on. And it's, this is not a, this is a, and the reason we agree, I think, is this is common sense. This is just plain common sense. This is not an ideological thing. This is common sense. And um, the other thing I think may be worth pointing out is, you know, what, so Bartlett's argument is that the burden of proof should be on, um, on the parents to uh, defend the idea that their child should not go to be put in school. You know, the burden of proof in every other instance that we have in our society where we institutionalize somebody is on putting them in the institution. You don't put, you can't put somebody in jail without proving that they need to be in jail. <laughs> you can't put somebody in a mental hospital without proving that they're going to be a harm to themselves or society if they aren't put in jail. And yet we put children in school just because of their age. Nobody has proved, as, Ke as Kevin so wonderfully pointed out, there's absolutely no proof that children need school or that they will do better in school. Nobody's proven that, At, even in generality, let alone to prove that my little daughter, if I have a little daughter right now, needs it. <laughs> You know, the burden of proof should be on them. Uh, lawyers, of course, would love it either way. They'd have all kinds of things to go to court about. <laughs> well, I want to thank everyone again for, for, for participating. I, I've received, you know, a tremendous amount of, of emails and, and messages, you know, just, just with the most positive outreach uh, from people with, with, you know, multiplicity of backgrounds. I mean, just, you know, from just everywhere, not even even just in America, but all, all over the world too. I mean, even, you know, it's, it's, it's been remarkable, you know, people in Pakistan, people in uh, uh, Czech Republic, I mean, all, all over, um, just, you know, very interested in the subject and, and very, you know, concerned uh, about either, you know, what, what opportunities are available. Uh, among the people that reached out, some were homeschooled, some some planned to, some you know again were just just interested. Uh, I think from from like a civil liberties perspective, um, but but you know you know so many of them just felt very threatened and and betrayed uh, by academia, uh, and and there was no opportunity for dialogue, and that was uh, the sense of frustration that also came through. And I just wanted to uh, initiate a forum. Um, obviously, there are many, you know, opportunities and, and you know, for, for information out there. But this this was, you know, just coming uh, because uh, Harvard uh, Magazine had had published the article. I, I thought, you know, a student organization affiliated with Harvard would be a good place to to initiate a forum to to honestly uh, discuss this concern. And uh, again, uh, thank everyone for attending. Thank the panel for, for participating. And uh, everyone can uh, watch uh, the uh, event or, or share it with, with friends uh, in, in the future. Thank you all.